Welcome to another episode of Dad Up, everyone. Thank you guys very much for joining me. I'm excited to have this individual on because he and I have actually just recently connected and I love his story and he's going to share all that and all the stuff he's doing. But my good friend, Tom Murphy, has joined me on Dad Up. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, man. Thanks so much. Great to meet you. And uh, I think I can say Semper Fi. I think I have the uh, right to say that. My uh, my daughter, Claudia, uh, is in the Marine Corps. Oh, just cool. Had a- yeah, yeah, just had a huge dad moment. I, I was kind of holding off to tell you this, but um, my daughter Claudia, I got three girls and uh, one young man uh, from 25 to Tom has just turned 19. But uh, my daughter Claudia at 18, she was the one that um, was a bit of a challenge, but she uh, came home at the age of 18 and said, uh, I joined the Marine Corps today. I said, Claudia, what are you talking about? What do you mean you joined the Marine Corps? And she said, Yeah, I joined the Marine Corps. And, uh, and I'm going to be in the infantry. I said, what? And, 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 and Claudia just pulls the trigger on everything without thinking that's just her personality. And so she goes to basic training, um, gets through with flying colors, gets assigned uh, as a mortarman uh, in the infantry, uh, goes to school, um, did very well. And then, um, you know, th- then she ran into a bit of a snag, just uh, some you know, most of the young other male Marines in the infantry in the Marine Corps, it's not the place for a lot of young women. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if I'd want to, and I can understand, I don't know if I'd want to get shot, you know, and um, be wounded and have a 120 pound young lady have to drag me, you know, three or four miles. So I, I kind of understand some of the context, but uh, Claudia fought through it um, tooth and nail. And um, it was tough for her, and she got deployed once, and she's getting ready for her second deployment right now. But uh, last week, man, um, I had some tears come to my eyes. Her captain actually got my info and sent me a um, uh, a voice recording of General Berger, who I believe is the commandant for the entire Marine Corps. And um, it's this about 10, 15-minute um, speech he was giving on women in the Marine Corps. And wouldn't you know – the last woman he brings up is Claudia Mm. and um, just talks about, you know, this young woman who, you know, you know, I don't need to give you this lecture. You know, you don't, uh, if you're in the Marine Corps, you got to do what everyone else does, or you drop out, you know, of form, you know, um, marches and other things that they do. Mm -hmm. So um, she got no grace from anyone and she fought through it. So uh, she just graduated a couple of weeks ago. Um, from the advanced infantry school. Um, awesome. She's the first woman in American history that's ever graduated from that school on the West coast. That's awesome. That's awesome, yeah, man. So, Proud well, dad. Thought, moment. Yeah. Yeah. I thought of you when uh, I knew I was going to be on the podcast and I said, I'll hold on to that a little bit and uh, tell you about Claudia. Oh, that's cool, man. That, I'm happy for her. That's awesome. And I'm happy for you as well. That's very, very cool. Uh, we're Let's let's do this. And so we're going to dive into that because I yeah. want to know more about that story and kind of the relationship between you and your daughter and especially her making that decision because I have my own story with me going in the Marines. But um, for my listeners who may not know who you are, um, tell me a little bit more about yourself, kind of how you grew up and then how you got into the things you're doing and then obviously about your family. Yeah, man, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. I'll try and keep this under five minutes or so. Um, it's a long story, man. It, my, my journey began in Philadelphia. Um, I was born and raised there till a, I was about in third grade or so. Um, my parents ran a mission home, used to take people off the streets of Philadelphia. Um, it wasn't a state-run home. It, it was just our my parents um, opening up our home to people that you know, were hopeless, that had nowhere to go. And I could write uh, an entire book on my different brothers and sisters growing up. Um, and we would go to prison on the weekends and visit, you know, brothers and sisters that sat at the dinner table with us the week before. Um, you know, we had, uh, uh, I could go on and tell you about Bobby Cummings, Karen Archer, Don, and most of the stories don't have happy endings, my friend. Mm. Um, you know, these were people that just had no place to go and they were truly hopeless. And uh, at the age of, I, I've said this a couple of times publicly, I, I, I just started talking about it a couple of years ago, but um, I slept in a bathtub for a year. Um, my parents gave my bedroom away to someone that needed it and their only hmm. biological son, you know, I got pushed into the third floor bathroom and uh, wow. my, my, my bed became the tub 
but it's okay. When you're a kid, there's like nothing like grabbing your blankets and your pillows and jumping in the tub, you know? And uh, so that was that, that was my life growing up. But I also was a struggling learner in the second or third grade. They labeled me dyslexic. And my dad just took me out of school and said, um, oh, that just means that you can read backwards better than other people. He said, the Jews do it. You'll be fine, <laughs> which is probably not the best thing to tell a struggling learner. Um, but you know, I, I, str- you know, he, he homeschooled me for a year and then he literally opened up a real estate catalog, pointed up to state New York, my mom and my father had, you know, just born and raised and grew up in Philadelphia, um, and just moved us, uh, p- p- opened it up, pointed to a page and moved us to upstate New York, bought a house for $34,000 and I uh, got into school, um, put me back into public school. And of course they labeled me, put me in a, uh, a, a combination class. It was like a three, four combination, you know, struggled through that year. They tested me. Of course, I, you know, got tested with some different abilities than other people. And, um, um, but my dad held me back a year, which was probably one of the best things he could have done. Um, you know, John Medina, the great molecular biologist wrote a great book. Anyone listening, you should, uh, I would hands down one of the greatest reads for teenage parents. It's called attack of the teenage brain. Uh, he's one of the great molecular biologists of our times. And and he um, he talks about this dual systems model that, you know, the we can look at a physical body and say, oh, he or she is ready for this or ready for that. But we don't look at the brain the same way. And my brain just was behind when it came to its maturation. And um, so my dad held me back a year, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, but I continued to struggle in school. I mean, I I've never met my academic equal. I graduated with a 630 combined score on my SATs. Uh, you probably got that on one half of your SATs. Um, I just had some challenges, but I found the sport of wrestling. And I should just take a step backwards uh, because a lot of young people will say to me, hey, what, Tom, when did you start wrestling? And I say, well, as soon as I could stand up, my dad knocked me down. Huh. And I had this innate, this insatiable, innate, um, I don't even know what to call it, spirit to put my hands on things. And when I was a kid, you know, every night, I'm not talking once a week, twice a week, every night we'd clear out the living room. My dad would get on his knees, put on some snow mittens. I'd put on these kids boxing gloves and we'd go at it. And this persisted until I got to be, you know, a young man and we would break beds and put holes in walls. And I mean, if my mom were on this call right now, she would, you know, she could tell you some horrific stories. And most of the time as a kid, it always ended in, you know, I'd say rage on my part. I was the kid that had to like, if I didn't win a game, I was going to turn the board over. Um, and I just couldn't stop. And the funny thing was neither could my dad and my dad never let me win a single thing, you know, whether it was a, a board game. Um, it was, it was, um, and, and, but I, as I look back, man, it wasn't anything malicious. It was just this nature that he and I had, and it was very similar. Um, but, you know, but I got that all under control once I found the competitive sport of wrestling. And it just dominated my life. I thought I was going to wrestle for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, what? once I graduated from high school, you know, I really wanted to wrestle in college. Uh, the long story I tell young people about how I got into college, it's almost will make you believe in cosmic forces. Um, but I ended up getting into college to wrestle really felt fall in love with education. A man came into my life, um, a guy named Dr. Owen Ireland, um, ran for the New York State Senate, just a brilliant, brilliant man. And he was the guy that taught me that life was not a talent contest. It's a strategy game. And those that have the great strategies in life win. And he just got me to see that I had every strategy that I needed to be successful in academics, just use the same strategies that I had developed through wrestling. And I talk to young people about those strategies all the time. Um, and I just started to apply them to, to academics. And I graduated with almost a perfect GPA in philosophy and psychology. Um, but I wasn't ready to stop wrestling. I did very well. I was runner up in the country my last year. And um, I found myself uh, married uh, at the age of 24, had a baby, um, was on my way to graduate school, Literally got derailed by the railroad industry where I spent 17 years, but I wasn't ready to stop wrestling, as I just said, and I'll land this plane pretty quick here so you can jump in. Um, I wasn't ready to stop wrestling, 
And I just happened to move to a part of the country um, that was an hour away from one of the greatest uh, teams on planet Earth in the sport of mixed martial arts. And I just started to train with those guys. And um, I did, didn't have any uh, thoughts of competing in sports, you know, professionally. It was pretty it was a lot smaller back then. Um, but I found myself, you know, in a couple amateur competitions and then a professional two competition or so. And um, and then I found myself on a crazy TV show called The Ultimate Fighter uh, season two, uh, which led to, a, you know, a little bit of time with the UFC. Um, but I was working at the same time. I was having developing a wonderful career and I uh, bought a couple businesses, owned a restaurant for 12 years at the same time, owned a pretty big gym at the same time. And I was doing all these different things. But what happened after the show was a lot of people called me that I knew and said, hey, my kids saw you. Could you talk to my volleyball team, my basketball team? And I just found myself talking to young people. This was about 14 years ago. Leadership, motivational, goal setting kind of stuff. And um, and I said, yeah, yeah. And, and then probably a year or two into it, you know, just doing maybe 20, 25 different little events every year for a couple of years. A buddy that I graduated college with and wrestled with called me in a panic and he said, hey, can you do something on bullying? And I'm like, yeah, maybe. Right. So I just took it from my perspective and I went another school, saw it and was like, whoa, that's incredible. Could you that do that at our school? And literally, man. Two million kids later, from Houston to Hawaii to Montreal and back, uh, my speaking partner and I have just crisscrossed this great nation. And um, we've been on a journey, man. It's been an incredible journey. Um, I'll kind of land on this key point here. When I first started talking to young people, I would find myself after a lot of assemblies in an auditorium with the lights going down, one or two kids wander back in, sneak back in, and just telling me their stories. and. Um, you know, really what it took me back to, man, was my childhood, because these were my brothers and sisters growing up, these people that were hopeless. And let's make no mistake about it, my friend. This generation is maybe amongst the most hopeless that planet Earth has ever known. I like to say to parents all the time that behavior is a form of communication, right? And this generation is communicating with us with their own hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, things like suicides in 10 to 14 year olds since 2007 have tripled. And uh, that may be the worst of the destructive decisions, but all of them are grossly on the rise. And that is an enormous conversation. It's an enormous challenge. It might be the greatest moral puzzle that we've ever faced in human history, mm -hmm. that our young people are leaving this world at a rate that maybe our veterans are. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at these destructive decisions uh, the, 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 the parallel is, is scary. Um, what's happening with our kids right under our noses. And we're not even really having the conversation in the general public. So that's man, that's the really quick, quick readers digest version. Um, I talk to parents every day of the week, usually, um, teachers, students. So there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, but, um, if there's something you want to jump onto, uh, Love to go yeah, I, I do. Um, there's a few things I want to unpack there because um, you, you talked a lot about your childhood and your relationship with your parents and stuff um, and how you guys were basically uh, helping other people, bringing them, bringing them essentially off the street and, and giving them a place to live. Um, with your dynamic with your own parents, you being in the house and then having to, like you said, sleep in a bathtub, I mean, what, what kind of relationship did you have with your parents that maybe translated into you being a dad? Well, you know, my relationship with my father, my dad's a, a tricky character. I mean, I've never met and everybody probably says this, but you know, my dad, um, I remember my grandmother, his mother telling me that he's been like this since he was in high school. You know, he, he, um, they stripped him of his, uh, he graduated with a thousand students in, in Philadelphia. And, you know, he was always like this in opposition to people. And my dad, oh man, there's just, I, I don't want to jump down too many rabbit holes, but, um, you know, my dad's the kind of guy that when the Jehovah's witness show up, he's like, Oh, come on in, come on in. And after hours and books and 
um, all kinds of stuff everywhere, all over the table. And I can remember as a kid, I was sitting up at the top of the stairs watching my dad. Um, they would always leave first and he'd invite them back and they would never come back because, uh, but, but he, he, it's really hard to describe him. I mean, he walked away from, he almost was finished with his PhD, just had to finish his dissertation and had a, um, disagreement with the sponsor of his dissertation and, and he left Ohio state and never finished his PhD. And he's just, oh, I've never seen my dad keep a job. He's always been in education. And after three or four years, he's going to tell you what's wrong, but it's always been in defense of the people that are hopeless, struggling kids and him saying, no, the way you're trying to train and teach and grow these young minds, you're wrong. They're not, you, you can't put a label on them. It's funny. It's just coming together for me right now. You know, my dad would say something like labels are for jelly jars. They're not for kids. And every kid is an individual. And, you know, that started with him opening up our home and bringing people in. Um, but it translated into the rest of his life, which, you know, really, I mean, I think my dad's story is a bit of a, a, a tragedy. Um, and if he were on here right now, he would convince me how wrong I am. Like if he was on here with us right now. So, yeah, you know, like that's my dad. And, you know, but um, there's parts of his. Um, uh, oh, man, I wasn't I wasn't planning on thinking about this. I thought we were going to talk about like, uh, you know, advice for parents. But um, but um, I've learned a lot from my father and he's probably one of the greatest impacts uh, influences in my life. But at the same time, I did make a couple of years ago the decision not to go down the road to ostracize people because of a belief system um, and not listening to someone else's perspective. My dad's uh, opinion is very strong, but it always is in defense of people that can't defend themselves. And I think that's the beauty of who he is. Mm -hmm. And my mom is just a super hard worker. Um, I, she's not a, um, I say she's not a, um, a cookie mom. She's a sheetrock mom. As a kid, I would come home from school and she'd have a, 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 a bandana over her mouth and she'd be up, you know, doing some sheetrock covered in dust. And I, I really think I get my hard work from my mom. Like, I don't have an off switch. I'm, I'm on every day, 365 days a year, I'm doing something um, to especially build the organization. So I don't think I really answered your question. Well, it's OK, um, because I, I think um, what's interesting, you talk about your dad and the way that he was is very opinionated and uh, it would would essentially, uh, for lack of better words, would essentially preach to these to these young people that would come into the home um, to help them. Right. Because you said that they felt lost, they felt helpless and he wanted to help them and, and essentially preach to them to help them, I guess, to help them learn and be better. But isn't it funny that, you know, he was that way. And here you are talking all over the country to young people in a different context, you know, and in, in, in speaking about something maybe different, but you're essentially helping them. You're, you're essentially helping them because you're helping them be better human beings. And so you almost followed the same light as your dad, uh, just kind of listening to your story. My dad couldn't make it in the public school system, though. And I've been in the public school system for about the last 12 or 13 years. And I have a real opinion about public education. I'm a product of public education. But my dad makes it about a year in a public school before they throw him out because he just won't back down. And 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 I've learned to temper that. I think yeah. there's this like really neat like form of like uh, not form, but um, version of Socrates you know, my dad's version of Socrates is like those who the, are the hardest to love are the ones that need it the most. I believe Socrates that said and get out of his way. He's going to be there to defend those people. Me, um, you know, like Socrates, they made him drink eucalyptus because, you know, they said he was uh, corrupting the minds of the youth um, where I have taken a more strategic or tactical position. Um, and it's allowed me to not sacrifice some of my own beliefs, but it's allowed me to do it in more of a head fake kind of way. You know, like when you teach someone something, if you head fake them, you're like playing a game with them, but you're actually teaching them a lesson. And for me, my motivation is not to butt heads with administration or parents. Mm -hmm. It's to grow with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, you know, I've been reading Robert Greene's book, um, 
the laws of human nature. And he talks about the fact that there's at any given time, there's like four generations alive. If you haven't read this book, man, it's just powerful. The laws of human nature, but you have these four generations alive at any given time, right? You got like the, the baby boomers, the Xers, the millennials and the Z's, right? And two generations are always in opposition to the others. And he has this wonderful quote that says um, something about like today's youth are godless and um, they'll never be able to preserve our culture. And it's from a thousand BCE hmm. on a piece of Sanskrit. Like nothing hmm. has changed. Right. But where where my dad would be part of one of these generations that would say, you know, you've got it messed up. I'm going to say, how do we bridge the gap between the generations? And I think, you know, I don't know if I got that from my mom tolerating my father for so many years, um, but something got me to say, you know what? I'm not going to be this argumentative, draw a line in the sand. I quit if you don't listen to me. Uh, and and I think it's because I've spent more time. I think it was G.K. Chesterton that said, I've spent more. He, he said, I, I in all my years of, I've learned more in the nursery than all my years of com- philosophy combined. And I think I've spent more time listening to young people um, and not just forming an opinion based on a belief system. Um, and I think it's just helped me be able to bridge the gap very nicely um, with a whole bunch of different entities. So yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, yeah. That's interesting. I, I want to um, shift gears a bit and talk about your influence on um, young people you know, young men and women, uh, you know, teenagers, I have kind of a, uh, well, I don't want to say similar cause it's really not, but I, I have done the same type of work in that, in that the way that I've taught young men and women, as far as, you know, their teenage years, as far as, uh, acad- I mean, um, athletics goes, cause I've been a coach, basketball coach, sports coach right. for, for over 20 years. Uh, and one of the things that I really loved about coaching, uh, obviously I'm a competitive guy. I want to win the games, you know, that kind of stuff. And I want my, my players to learn the fundamentals and learn the plays and all those things. Right. But one of the things that I loved about coaching was pouring into these young men uh, and, and that maybe grew up in a home life that was, that was hard. Maybe they didn't have a dad. I can tell you, I, uh, I can tell you there's so many players that I've coached who had parents that I've never met because they just never showed up for anything for their, for their child. And to listen to these, to these uh, young men talk to me and be able to pour into them. That's, I just loved it. I just loved every minute of it. And so much so that even after I uh, had a player in high school that had graduated and he was kind of lost and didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. And he reached out to me and he said, coach, can we just sit down? I want to talk to you and see if maybe you can give me some direction because he didn't have a dad in his life and his mom worked two jobs. She was never around. And so I, I said, yes, but here's, here's, here's the rules. I want you to have some goals written down that you want to do. And I want you to be prepared for the work that I'm going to give you to help you. And if you can do those two things, I'll sit down with you. And he said, yes, I'll do that. So we sat down for lunch and we chatted for a good two hours, Uh went over his goals, went over the things that he wanted to do. He wanted, really wanted to play college football and he he wasn't in school and he wanted to play college football. And we sat down, we wrote out a game plan. I gave him some books to read. I told him, these are the things I'm going to do for you. These are what you're going to do for me. I'm going to check in with you. I'm going to make sure, make sure you're staying on track. All that stuff happened. Make a long story short, the kid ultimately ended up playing college football. Um, And I don't, I don't, I don't take the credit for that, sure. but I take, you know, some of the guidance that he needed and what I poured into him to help him along the way. He ultimately made the decisions and the and took the right steps to get into school and to start playing ball. Mm-hmm. But he took the time to sit down with me and I gave him the steps on what he needed to do to get there. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's so cool that you're helping these young people. Uh, in a, in a, in a world that's tough in a world that's hard when it comes to bullying though, I think that's really a, a hot topic, especially over the last couple of years. 
um, a hot topic and you talk about bullying and then suicide. I mean, all that stuff's just so prevalent right now with, with what's going on in the world. Um, how, how does that impact you and your relationship with your kids? I mean, have you had those same kind of conversations with your, with your own children? And I'm going to further that by saying, if there are parents out there that are struggling with their child being bullied and not sure how to get around it or how to, how to, you know, fix it, what kind of advice could you give to them? Oh man, that's, you, you said a lot there. Um, I, I, my brain was going in about 10 different directions as you were you know, unfolding a lot of that. Um, oh man, well, I'll, I'll kind of end on bullying. Um, it's something that we talk about. Um, I would tell you that, you know, I used to use the word bullying all the time. We're the bully guys, the stop, drop and roll of bullying. We do K-12, um, messages, um, and our message really has centered on empowering students. And a lot of people think, oh, you're empowering students that are marginalized, students that are bullied. And I say, no, not really. That was never the intent of our message. Our message started out um, with this word, sweethearts. And people say, well, sweethearts, what does that mean? Well, the word bully um, in the 16th century meant sweetheart. Hmm. It was paused there because someone's going to yeah. say, hmm, and they're going to yeah. smile. It nice. was a very endearing term. It was someone that came into your life. And they said, hey, man, get your crap and get in the car. You pick this sport. You're not quitting. You're going to finish the season. You know, you brought that instrument home and it was really hard. You thought you were going to be a rock and roll star, but you, you realized how hard it was. And they're like, hey, young man, I bought that instrument for you. Let's go get it out of his case and start practicing. Or maybe when you were in, in college one day and life was tough and you didn't feel like getting out of bed, you know, he or she called you up and said, get your stuff on. I'm coming over. We're going out. Those are your 16th century bullies, the people in your life. And what they really gave you was hope. And that's really my my speaking partner, Rick. 70% of his body was instantly burned away in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I uh, hit an IED in a Bradley September 1st, 2006. He, if he were on here, he would tell you it's the best thing that ever happened to him. Um, and, uh, and it's really because of all the hope he's been able to give young people over the years. But... What he was given that brought him through those challenges over a decade was hope. And that was the inception of our message was really about empowering other young people that are in those environments. Because really, I mean, the environment just dictates everything. I mean, most parents think that they have an influence on their kid. And um, I think it's, what's his name? Russell Barkley from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, did a ton of stuff on this with ADHD kids and found that maybe you have an influence on your kid between zero and seven. But once a kid gets to, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, your influence on them drops dramatically. And you know this, right? Your yeah. kids came home and they learned something from another man, one of your friends, maybe a teacher. And you're like, dude, I've been telling you that for right. years. Right. And they just don't listen to you, right? And they do listen to you. And it's pretty cool. Once they get older, they come back to you. And you're like, oh, they did get it. But growing up, I think Harvard did a great study and said the number one contributing factor for a young man's success is having a positive male role model. That's it. It doesn't always have to be a dad, but it's got to be that model. And um, young women is a, I, I want to say it's a completely different discussion. I love talking about young women. I own three of them or used to. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to stay in this vein of young men for a second. Uh, because I've got a tremendous connection with young men. You know, when you play, you know, a minute or two of you locked into a cage and blood and fists and you run out on stage and you, the first thing you say is, who knows what the name of that sport is? And then finally, when you land on the word mixed martial arts, you say, I'm going to tell you one thing about mixed martial arts and I'm not going to mention it for the rest of the time that we're together. You ready for this? I hate fighting and all those young men are like what the right. i'm here to talk about bullying you hate fighting that's not what i saw on the screen and i take just a minute or two in a 90 minute assembly to educate young people about the sport of mixed martial arts it's a competition like any other competition i see zero violence in mixed martial arts i see a ton of aggression but violence is perpetrated on people outside of their will and so i just can hook young men and then I had the opportunity to give them these great lessons. And really, a lot of the lessons that we give, it's about, you know, vulnerability. 
if I were to say to you, making yourself vulnerable, it makes you feel what? Weak. Right. It's the first thing people say. And I say, okay, imagine when your son was seven or eight, or you had a little daughter that's seven or eight, and she comes home and says, Daddy, I want to do the talent show. And she picks out a song. The night of the talent show comes. You know, the auditorium's packed with people. She runs up on that stage. We'd all say she's making herself vulnerable. By definition, it means opening up yourself to attack. Most people don't realize that's why Superman ripped that shirt open, because people were going to judge him for what he believes, for the people he helps. That little girl gets up there on that stage. She might forget her lines. People might laugh at her. But are you telling me that she's weak? weak? It's a question. Are you telling me that she's weak? Yes. Like getting up there on the stage? No. You'd say no. no. You know, superheroes live in the world of vulnerability, and vulnerability equals strength. And so our message, especially, I don't want to say especially for young men, but for students, it's really been about empowering those young people that already have superpowers that probably have picked them up from the other great influencers in their lives, getting them to understand that you may look silly and ridiculous helping someone that can't help themselves, but the world doesn't change unless you do it. I mean, it was Solzhenitsyn that said that the universe has as many centers as there are human beings. So if you can get one kid to help one other kid, you've changed the world because you've changed that kid's world. And a lot of the time, it's just about, you know, that ignition and getting kids to understand that they're the ones that need to change the world, not you and I, but them. And uh, and a lot of what we do is um, getting young people to, we would say, jump into action and help young people that are struggling in those environments. Because honestly, man, I can go talk to a kid once or twice, but I'm really not going to change that kid's state, right? I'm not going to change his his or her state. But the other kids in that environment, in that school's, are the ones that have the ability to take the lessons that they've gotten from all their influencers once they understand and practice jumping into action using some of these great skills that they picked up from different influencers in their lives to help the people around them. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit off track because I got about 10 different directions that you, you when, when you were talking about, you know, young people and, uh, but, but how, is that, in- how has that impacted you as far as how, how have you um, kind of taught your own kids those kinds of uh, lessons that you're trying to teach all these other kids? Oh, man. How, what kind of conversations has has gone on with you trying to be not only the dad, but also, you know, essentially the educator? Yeah, man, that's a tough, tough one for me. It's It's something I don't know if I've fully unpacked yet in my own life. I have this existential guilt. I'm not sure if that's quite the right way to frame it, but... Um, I wrestled with this one for a long time. I don't talk much about this, and I probably should. But I hope I I was a good dad. Um, I really do. Um, I got a daughter that's 25 who is a general manager for a restaurant of 70 employees. I got one that's in the Air Force, and she's a crew chief, and she changes engines on F-35s. I've got Claudia, who's the Marine. And then I got Thomas, who's 19. And um, I worry that I was spending more time. I mean, I'm on the road 200 days a year, man, since 2014. Mm. And, you know, I worry that, I don't know, I I, I hope I didn't abandon my own kids for other kids. Mm. And, you know, I was like, I don't know, man, it's a tough one. I wasn't thinking about even talking about this today. Um, I think that as I look at my kids today, though, I think that the model that I displayed for them, even though I was absent a lot, talking to other kids, I don't know. I don't know if it's about taking your kids to Disney World. I don't know if it's about spending all that time camping and hunting and fishing with them. Um, I don't know. You got me kind of stumped here, man, because I think a lot about this one, and I don't know how to unpack it because the story hasn't been finished yet. And I guess I got to see where my kids land. I think they're pretty well adjusted, um, but we'll see. Time will tell. I don't know you got me a little. Well, it's on this one. it's sound. It sounds like they're they're pretty well adjusted. Uh, I mean, you got two that are essentially in the military. Um, one that's a manager. What's the what's your son doing? 
Is he going to college or my, my so I, I'm I told all my kids not to go to college. I said, don't waste your time on college. That's a that's a fun conversation too. But, well, you know, come on, man. You know, when you look at what are the two things that human beings need outside of food, shelter, and water, right? We all need two things. There are these common threads that we between all of us. Number one is some kind of meaning or purpose, some kind of significance, right? That's what one of the things that leads someone to feeling hopeless on the inside is they really struggle with meaning or purpose. I mean, when Rick came back and he got 70% of his body was taken from him, he was a leader of men. He was a football player, wrestler. And in the blink of an eye, it was taken from him. And he lost that meaning. And and our children today, it may be in the most advanced technological civilization Earth has ever known, struggle with meaning. And, you know, it was... um. Who was it? Was it Chesterton also? Um, I don't think it was Chesterton, but he said meaninglessness does not come from the exhaustion of pain. Meaninglessness comes from the exhaustion of pleasure. We have over uh, accentuated our kids today, everything they have, but this lack of meaning that they search for, that every human searches for, they struggle with it. And so, you know, when I talk about college, a lot of the times it's like youth sports, right? Youth sports can be a disaster because it's more about dad's significance than it is about the kids. You know, dad still wants to be out there on the field. Right. You know, so when I talk about college, a lot of times there was a time, uh, you know, when I was younger, I'm a generation Xer and you kind of had to go to college, but I don't know if you have to today. And, you know, just like youth sports could be about dad's significance. I think college a lot of times could be about mom's significance. You know, mom likes to tell her friends that, you know, Jenny's going here, Billy's going there. I don't know if we need college anymore these days. And I, I don't want to open up a can of worms and, and and debate that. But, you know, I think a kid is should go to college when they're ready to go to college, not when we tell them they should go to college. And, and I talk to tens of thousands of students a year, and every one of them, if you ask them why they're going to college and you really dig into it, it's because their parents want them to. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely yeah, so, right. Go ahead. So I, I was just off with a little tangent there, like I told you I would. But so um, you asked about my son, Thomas. My son, Thomas, is really into weightlifting, strongman stuff. And, um, you know, he's, you know, and so he's working in the direction of personal training. And just, you know, I, I just believe you should always let a child. Your job as a parent is two things, because I said there's these two common threads that we all share. One of them is this need for significance or purpose or meaning. Your job as a parent is to grow that significance, that meaning, that purpose. Put them in environments that are rich in cultivating what they want to do. You know, I had this dad one time. I was standing there talking to him and his daughters. I was just talking to his daughter and I was like, what do you want to do as you get older? And she goes, well, I want to cut hair. And the dad turns to her and says, oh, you can do more than that, sweetie. And I turn and look at the guy and I said, you know, I got a friend of mine that makes millions of dollars cutting hair. I said, she's too good for that. He's like, oh, no, that's not what I meant. I said, well, she's got to start with a chair. Right. Maybe then she'll own this salon someday. But it's really about her significance, not yours, dad. Right. And so for me, my job as a parent is to grow my the significance of my child. My daughter Isabel could fly a plane before she could really even drive a car. You know, she took some $50 an hour flying lessons and got her junior pilot's license before she could even drive a, a car. And today she's changing engines on F-35s. Just because I recognized one of her, you know, that, that we, we built around her what she wanted her significance to be. And so that's just one of the great jobs of parenting is just identifying what their significance is, not yours, and growing it. And that's really hard for a parent because you've got to shelf what you want for your kids. Mm -hmm. And every parent knows what they want for their kid, but they're not you. And that, that guy uh, um, from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, talks about this too, that you're this beautiful mosaic of your extended family, not of you, right, dad or mom. Right. And so you got to let them develop, man. Yeah, no, I, you're absolutely right. I think that uh, we have to, as parents, we have to stop hoping that our kids are 
going to grow up like us because we're two separate people. Even though they're part of us, we're two separate people. You want your children to be better than you. You want your children to, I love it that you said what you said about significance, having significance or purpose. It's funny that you bring that, that we talk about college because a lot of times kids go to college and they don't know why they're going and they don't know what they want to do even after they graduate college. That happens a lot. And so it's determining. I, I, re, I remember when I was a, when I was a child, I wanted to be a cartoonist. And then I started going to community college when I got out of high school and I had an art, a, a drawing class that I was part of. And I drew this picture and the professor ripped on it. Like, and I thought it was great. I thought it was brilliant. They, she said, draw a picture of something that draws itself. And so I drew a cartoon character. It was a, it was a fox. I drew a fox on this big poster board, colored it, did the whole nine yards. And I had him holding a pencil and drawing his own body. And I thought it was brilliant. But my mm. teacher said, you completely missed the point. And she, and ever since that day, I wanted out of school. I wanted nothing to do with school. And it, oh. and it shot that dream down that I had that professor. And I came home and I told my dad, I, I'm, I'm going to take a break from college uh, because I would just want to work and, and relax. And he said, okay. He goes, I, I said, I'll go back after I take, you know, maybe a semester off. He said, I'm going to tell you something. You'll never go back. Hmm. If you quit now, you'll never go back. And I said, well, I, I will. And he said, okay, well, if you're going to quit college that we're paying for, then you're going to start paying rent because you're not doing anything else. You're going to start paying rent. And so that's how the, the job of the military came up. I started uh-huh. talking to my manager at my the store that I worked and he said, you need to go in the Marines if you want to go in the military. And that's how that started. I went home, told my parents, I'm going in the Marine Corps. And my dad said, good for you. My mom said, no. Uh, so that's how my story of the Marines got started. I just said, I'm going in the uh-huh. Marines. Um, but I kind of, I run all over. I get off on tangents as well. Yeah. But my that's point okay. is, my point is, is that, yes, kids need to find that purpose. And a lot of times that purpose changes throughout their life. When yeah. they're younger, they want to be a veterinarian. They want to be a fighter, fire, a firefighter or something like that. And then as they get older, that may change. Um, but parents is really honing in on their significance and helping them, whether it is, maybe it is college, you know, maybe they do want to go to college. My son wanted to play college basketball. That's what he wanted to do. And he ended up playing college basketball. My other son went to college because he wanted to own a business. He wanted to learn about business. Mm -hmm. So he thought going to college was the right thing for him. Um, Yes. You need to find your, your kids significance and hone in on it and help them develop it and make it stronger. Um, I think that's great. Here's the greatest gift that you can give a kid. So one of my favorite authors is a guy named Stuart Brown. He wrote a great book called play P L A Y. And he makes a very bold claim. He's one of the great play scientists of our time Um, between him and Peter Gray and uh, any parent listening should go to psychology uh, today and look up Peter Gray's work. He's one of the greatest. He wrote a great book called free to learn uh, top five, one of my favorite books, but, but this book by Stuart Brown is called play. And here's the claim that he makes. He says, everything a child learns to transition success, excuse me, back up everything a mammal learns to transition successfully from childhood into adulthood. They learn in one place and one place only in self-directed, self-controlled play, everything. It did not come from you, mom, or dad. It did not come from a classroom. It came from self-directed, self-controlled play. That's where you get socialized. You, You must get socialized by the age of four or five, or you have some real challenges as you get older and as you continue to mature, if you're not socialized properly. But all of your negotiation, your cooperation, your teamwork, everything is derived from the thousands of repetitions that you put in when you're playing with other mammals, usually a year or two older than yourself, because you're trying to replicate their behavior. Now, when you talk about play, though, Stuart Brown talks about the 12 great play personalities. My daughter, Abigail, if my wife were sitting right next to me right now, she'd be like, oh, my gosh, you could hear her growing up. She was the oldest. 
in the other room with her sister, the one that's in the Air Force. Isabel, say this. Isabel, do this. Isabel, say this. Abby is a director. That's a great one of the great 12 play personalities. She's just a director. She manages 70 employees, and she's been doing it since she's been 20 years old. And most of them are old enough to be her mother or her father at a restaurant. 70 employees. But she's been a director her whole life. There are explorers. There are collectors. Uh, there are kinesthetes. I mean, there's these 12. There's certainly not just these 12 pers- play personalities, but these are like the big groups of play personalities. Uh, the personalities that people have that will guide their play. So when I work with a lot of parents and students, I say, what's your play personality? Most people have no idea. Right. But Stuart Brown says, if you can tie your play personality to your adult life, you will always find joy. If I go into a room and I have a hundred educators and I say, who played teacher growing up about 75% of them will put their hands up in the air. And, uh, they are not the ones ever that are like, like I meet a lot of teachers and you're like, hey man, how many years you got left? Well, I got uh, seven years, 12 days, three right. hours <laughs> and six seconds left. And you know what I always say to them? Oh, you never played teacher growing up, did you? <laughs> when you tie that. So, so when you look at significance and purpose, I always tell parents, start there. What's your kids play history? What's their play personality? And now your job is to to put them in those environments to grow that because you can't ever change it. Mm -hmm. If you start to analyze your own play history, your own play personality, it's impossible to change it. That's the way that you were wired. And most people say, ah, you know, I can't do that when I get older. Well, why not? Why can't you do a derivative of that? Whatever that thing is that you love doing. Instead of settling for what your parents want you to do, which right. kind of screws you up for the rest of your life. Right. Uh, no, I, it's funny when you're talking about that, I'm thinking about my own life and just the fact that I wanted to be a cartoonist and, and get into that kind of line of work because I love to draw. I love to do those kinds of things. And I didn't, I didn't follow that path yet. I still have found myself even into my adult life drawing it some in some way and it's still that's that passion or that love is still there i mean i did christmas caricatures out on our front yard i made out of wood that i painted and like all the different characters for christmas santa and all his sleigh and rudolph and i did all that stuff and had these art displays in my front yard for christmas so i still have that passion to do it but 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 imagine if your parents wrapped you in all of that growing up and they're like, whoa, buddy. And imagine where you'd be today. I mean, I'm glad that you, your parents screwed you up the way you did because then we wouldn't have got a chance to meet, right? <laughs> I'm being funny. But just imagine that, you know, yeah. if, if our parents wrapped us in those things that we found joy in. Yeah, no, it's you're absolutely right, man. That's so good. That's so good, man. Um, gosh, I feel like... Tom, I feel like we could probably talk for a couple more hours. Uh, oh, yeah, really man. could, because there's so many different uh, things that we could talk about uh, that we have just literally ran out of time for. Um, so I might have to have you back on just because the conversation has been so so raw, so genuine, uh, yeah. and just been really great. Um, for my listeners, want to look you up. Can, learn- can, can I, can I, can I, I Go mentioned ahead. two things, and yes. somebody's going to listen and say, well, you said two things. We all need two things. So just give me just a couple minutes. Because sure. This is very, very important, especially to the work that we do. You know, I'm not sure if there's any. Um, um, I, I, so the, the second thing that we all need that even service members struggle with, it's why 22 a day take their own lives. Mm-hmm. You know, they have this struggle with meaning or purpose. Um, but the other thing that really leads someone to a feeling of hopelessness, and, and I learned this from my childhood, um, but now as I've studied it, um, it's human acceptance. And, you know, we're just a bunch of pack animals. And uh, if you understand that as an educator, it makes kids real easy to teach. I just watched a, a teacher yesterday move a kid in an auditorium and separated him from his pack. And the second she did that, he's like, mm-hmm. 
not because he was in trouble, just because he couldn't be with his pack. And once a kid hits those formative years, a lot of times their friends become more important than their own families. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. It's supposed to be that way. In Attack of the Teenage Brain, um, um, he talks about this as well. He talks about this program that runs in a teenage brain. You cannot stop it. It's been running for hundreds of thousands of years. They become very disagreeable, very prickly. Um, they seek novel sensations. They do really stupid things. You know, mom would keep that kid till he's 30 in the teepee. But at, you know, 12 or 13, he's got to wander out into the wilderness where he could get eaten by lions and shot by arrows. But it's just a biological program that runs because, you know, you're not supposed to mate with your own pack. So you got to go out and find a new pack and you can't stop it. And a lot of parents try and stop it. You can't, you can't, it's impossible. But that deep need for acceptance, you know, parents say to me all the time, they say, well, okay, I can help build my kids significance by paying attention, tying it to their play personality, tying it to their play history, wrapping them in environments that are rich, like miracle grow to grow that significance. Mm -hmm. But how am I going to make them accept other people? And I say, well, I don't know if we can, but what we can do, and I like to do this in, in groups of people. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone do this, but Simon says, make a circle. Mm -hmm. You ever seen this? Mm -hmm. Just Now hold that circle up. I got to see it. Simon says, take that circle. Now watch me and put it on your chin. Mm -hmm. Now, now, do you have a hard time hearing, young man? No. Are you trying to piss me off? <laughs> no. What did I say, young man? Put it where? Oh, yeah. No, I said, put it where? <laughs> you weren't listening. <laughs> now, if you go back and listen to the tape, I said, put it on your chin. You did? And why did you do this? Because you did it. Now, about 20% of the neurons in your motor cortex are made up of these really funny neurons called mirror neurons. And if I had to give a parent one lesson, and I just did this. You just did this because that's what I did. I just tickled those mirror neurons. They were designed to just follow motion. That's right. all they're designed to do. Right. Now, when I talk to parents, the number one parenting lesson, parenting is never about what we say. It's about what we see, what we do, right. what we see. Right. When we fire those mirror neurons, largely. And that's a very, very big responsibility for a parent. Because most of the time, the subconscious will, you know, says that they say the subconscious mind makes 96 to 97 percent of your conscious decisions every day. That's some scary stuff when you mm -hmm. really analyze what you're doing as a parent. So <laughs> when I talk about human acceptance, you can't make kids accept other kids. But what you can do, mom and dad. Is you can model that acceptance, especially of those people that are the most challenging. And when your neighbor is on your lawn by like a half an inch with his lawnmower and you're scrubbing the dishes, you know, looking out the window, like that guy's always on our lawn. And your daughter goes to school and someone puts a piece of tape and it's like touching her locker by a little bit. You know what she's going to do? She always puts it on my locker. She's just going to do exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what you tell them with young people. And I have this debate, this conversation, not really a debate, but this conversations with parents all the time. I told my daughter, what is she seeing? You're right. Does she see when you're walking with her as a little girl down the street and here's this homeless guy coming down the street and you're like, oh, sweetie, let's go to that side of the road. Right. Or when you're coming out of the grocery store and you're like, let's let him go by first, sweetie. Right. What are you showing her? Because it doesn't really matter what you tell her, because when she gets to be in, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade, you're going to push her out the door and say, hey, make sure you stick up for those kids that are different, sweetie. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't matter. And so when we talk about the other great thing that we all share, that we all need, it's to be accepted. And the only way we change this world today is by showing our kids how we can bend the knee, can make ourselves vulnerable, which makes us feel really super weak. And we can go out of our way to help those people, especially that are hopeless, because our kids will never be able to do those skills, no matter what their significance is, no matter what their meaning ends up being. It all comes down to one thing, the relationship that we have with other people on this earth.
I think it was Tolstoy that said, everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. And just like Mother Teresa said, you can change the world by starting with the person right next to you. And mm -hmm. that's what we need to model to our children if we're going to fix this mess that's going on in the world today. Oh, so good, man. So good. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, that's why I got to have you back on. <laughs> There's so much more we can talk about, but uh, yeah, you're, it's so true. Um, I, I see the parents that struggle with that every single day. Uh, even the dads that I coach, I see them struggle with that. Uh, and it, you're absolutely right. Um, gosh, really good, Tom. Really good, yeah, man. man. Um, yeah. If my listeners want to look you up, learn a little bit more about you, best places for them to do that. Yeah. Just sweethartsandheroes.com. They can find some stuff, but you know, I have a, I try and have a hundred percent response rate on emails. So it's hard. Um, I travel 220, 230 days a year sometimes. Uh, but I try and get back to everybody and, um, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I think this is what I'll do for the rest of my life, man, is, uh, <laughs> make a difference in people's lives. Well, you are. And, uh, I know you will. Um, thank you again, brother, for being on. We didn't even get to talk about girl power yet. Right. That's we'll save it for the next one. Or, or being a husband, which is probably more important. Oh than being my gosh. A father, being a husband, opinion. being a husband, the, the, I, I always talk about it, that the, the foundation of our family is the husband and wife. Amen. And how they treat each other and Amen. how they how they respond and, and act with each other. That is the foundation of your family right there. Uh, I talk about it all the time. So I'll leave wife. you with a cliffhanger. I said this once in front of 500 women. I said, if I have my kids, all four of them in my hand and my wife, and they were both hanging over a cliff and I had to let one go, my kids or my wife. I wouldn't hesitate. I'd let all four of my kids go. I wouldn't even think twice. I think that your spouse has to become the most important person in your life before your children. And what I do think you th that's where a lot of men make sense. What do you think? You, up. Where do you think your your wife would say? Uh, I Well, um, <laughs> you'd have to ask her. But but it's an interesting thing, man, because, you know, your dad can be in prison and you know, a kid will be like, oh, my dad, he's a great dad. He just made some mistakes. You'll always have a relationship with your parent. But a lot of people, they have a child and they start putting the child before their spouse, which in my opinion is a huge mistake. Yep. You know, you'll always have a good relationship with your kids if you have a good relationship and your spouse comes first. Yep. Absolutely. That's another Absolutely. discussion. Yep. I know I'm, I'm completely on board with you. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's something that my wife and I strive to do every day, uh, especially when my kids were growing up, uh, is just model who we are as a couple, because we believed that that's where uh, our kids foundation really starts and how they see and, and, and the way they hear us and see us interact with each other. And my wife and I, my boys are grown. They're grown men. But my wife and I still make our marriage a priority, whether we read every night, we have a marriage book that we read out of every night mm -hmm. uh, together. We spend a half an hour reading the chapter and then we sit and talk about it. It allows us to bond and connect. We either do that or we have a marriage game that we play. We we mix it up wow. between the two, you know, between those two. We have a marriage coach that we go to see every wow. other month. Uh, those kinds of things are important and we believe they're important. Uh, even though our kids are adults now, they know the kind of parents we are. They know the kind of couple we are, but we still want to maintain that relationship. And that's why Amen. we do that stuff. So, um, so good, man. I, I I'm excited already to have you back on. Uh, Anytime, look, I'm looking forward to it. Um, all right. Well, cool. Thank you very much, Tom, for being on. I'm sorry we went long, but, uh, it's all good. Ah, <laughs> if, listen, if you need anything, please 24 7 365 get a hold of me if someone is in need that's struggling with something um you know and uh yeah i've just given my life to this if if i can help in any way let me know yeah absolutely well thank you again for being on listen everybody uh, if you're not checking out Sweethearts and Heroes, please do that. I'll put the links in the show notes, but I just want to thank my good friend, Tom, for being on the show again. He, he's a wealth of knowledge and really is making a change in the world when it comes to our young, young children, our young teenagers, 
Uh, he's doing what he can out there to help not only them, but you as parents. So make sure you're checking out what he's doing. And if you haven't subscribed yet to my show, please make sure you're doing that. So you don't miss any of the awesome guests that I have on each and every week. And as always, I look forward to seeing you all on the next episode of Dad Up. Wow. Another amazing episode in the books. So much was shared and I'm truly grateful my guest was able to pour into you to help you elevate your dad game and really dad up. Make sure you bang that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're here, please don't forget to leave me a rating and a review. I always appreciate the feedback. And one last thing, don't forget, your role as a dad is one of the most important roles you have. So if you need a little help or have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me on my website at daduptribe.com or at my Instagram page at daduppodcast. Until next time, everyone, Data. up.